It's a really nice evening. Uh, today is Tuesday, April 16th. This is the Town Council's Finance Committee meeting. We are in the Council Chambers. Um, the purpose of tonight's meeting is to begin our budget review process, having received our budgets from the superintendent and from the manager. Um, just for the record, um, all three members of the committee are present. Um, we also have um, our school board guests and staff, um, which we'll go through introductions in a second. And um, what I did want to uh, kind of uh, start off with is a couple of comments and then to explain for the public, uh, particularly those who are watching, because there's been a lot of questions about process and how um, not only tonight, but even um, the municipal budgets will be presented. Uh, so I wanted to kind of cover that. Um, as I begin, I want to uh, first uh, explain a couple of um, pathway issues. Um, I'll open the meeting with some brief comments expressing the norms that we as governing boards between the school board and the town council's finance committees have agreed to in developing the budget and in building our relationship. I'll also try to explain briefly the value perspectives of having our educational leaders discuss programmatic level information and legal parameters that are then set forth in our rules, town council rules, the town charter, and state law when making decisions around um, this school, the school portion of the budget. Um, I then expect to turn the floor over to the manager for introductions and comments on the work process undertaken through the submission process. I'm in coordination with the superintendent and any updates or actions taken since Wednesday's last Wednesday's outcome. Um, he's expressed that those comments might be general and brief. Um, and then Mr. Hall, I expect, will then turn the presentation over to the superintendent and the school board. <coughs> I do want to emphasize that the style, substance, and detail of the presentation um, has been left up to the professional staff of the school department and to the board, and we all have full faith in that leadership. Um, to clarify around um, questions and answers session, um, there will be a Q&A session at the end. Uh, first, we will have questions and discussions from the Finance Committee members that are present here. Um, a slightly amended public comment process will follow such that I'll ask or read any previously submitted questions received from counselors um, that may have been present that may not be present because some people are out of town um, I'm going to then ask if there's any counselors present and we do have one present um, if they would like to um, ask any questions relating to educational resources so that we can vet those in advance and then if they counselor also wishes to make a statement they can do that after the questions have been answered um, if they can be answered um, and then we'll turn it open um, to all the rest of the public for general public comments um, and then we'll take questions or you know we'll try to do questions um, you know, at the same time, but uh, the general public will then be able to make comments at the end, and then we'll have our closing remarks. The agenda also includes a review of um, uh, future meetings, and um, I know that the school board has presented us with some questions regarding process that we'll also undertake at the close of that kind of process, um, or close of that. And then um, I'm going to ask the, the committee to have a conversation um, at the end to talk about next steps um, particularly regarding um, last Wednesday's decision uh, in reducing the budget by a million three and what is uh, going to be our next steps and how we're going to work together with the school department as well as the other departments that still have not reported to us. Um, so that's kind of the flow. Um, I, I do want to, I'm not going to read all of the norms and goals, but I think that we've gone through a very positive relationship process over the last three to four years and we've really reiterated the norms and goals that we've always had and set out in the beginning. I'm only going to emphasize a couple of these. The first is that we've agreed that we're going to respect the roles and unique responsibilities of the Joint Finance Committee members. Um, the school board has their very distinct roles in, in identifying the educational resources, and tonight we're hoping that, or expecting that you will tell us what those are, needs are, and then the council has its respective role as well in the oversight body um, in making the final determination. Um, and then the only other one I'm going to uh, kind of bring to this is, um, or bring forward is that the very last bullet is that we bring a sense of humor to the table and understand that um, we all have the best interests of Scarborough um, in our work effort. Um, with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to Tom um, for his introductions and uh, comments. Yeah, my introductions uh, were really focused on what's occurred since the council took action last Wednesday. Um, doing what we do, Julie and I did convene the day after and then again on Friday morning to really just talk about what the next steps might be. Uh, lacking any you know, very clear direction, uh, that conversation was somewhat uh, limited, but uh, we did have uh, a couple of, of good thoughts, I think, uh, a couple of the guiding principles, and Julie, please speak up if I uh, misspeak at all, uh, but some of the guiding principles are we want to focus uh, if, uh, really on the policy-driven components of the budget request, 
and most of those uh, are really shown in the capital budget, and there's any number of considerations that uh, I think we should be looking at, including possible deferment of projects, the, uh, the method of finance of capital projects. I have been, what I've characterized as aggressive, more aggressive than ever before in terms of uh, proposing financing by way of appropriation, so there's some decisions that can be made there. Uh, and also the creation of this and funding for the capital uh, equipment reserve is another point worth looking at. Um, there's a fair amount of resources caught up in those, in those categories. Nearly half of the adjustment that's been requested uh, can probably be had in there uh, by my estimation. But again, I don't want to get ahead uh, and certainly um, talk about any deferments. Those are projects that I think are worthy of some conversation. Uh, but in my estimation, I think there's a fair amount of territory that can be covered there alone. Beyond that, I think Julie and I would agree that we want to uh, certainly do no harm with the classroom and, uh, and nor to town services. And so those would be kind of the guiding principles that we take forward. Uh, so I sit here before you this evening without a clear path, and I await direction, and I think the Finance Committee is probably the one, the best body to provide that direction so we can get about the work and, and move uh, this process forward. <coughs> I don't really have anything to add. I, I would just echo what the town manager said, and um, we also have some questions about process that we'll ask throughout the presentation. Great. So I'll turn it over to um, Julie, and if you can do introductions and start your presentation, that'd be great. Sure. So I'll start with, we have two um, board members who are here uh, joining us and supporting us in the audience, um, Nick Gill and Leanne Casleonis as our school board chair. And I know that um, Amy Glidden is not here with us tonight, but she has been supportive and involved as we've been processing sort of the decision in the amendment that happened on Wednesday. I'm here as the business manager for the school department. My name is Kate Fulton. I'm here as the superintendent, Julie Kuckenberger. My April Sither, school board. Alicia Giftis, school board finance committee member. And Sarah Leighton, finance committee member. Great. Um, and before you, because you can go into, um, if you can speak up, because there's some people that are already indicated in the audience that can't hear, um, which might also mean they can't hear at home. So it's to have our use our uh, bigger voices, I guess. Okay. Go ahead. So I'm going to kick us off just by um, reading a, a statement on behalf of the board, and then I'll hand it over to Julie, and we'll, we'll start the presentation. We come to the table tonight with a desire to move forward for the benefit of our district and the community. In order to progress in an effective and transparent way, we do have a number of questions as to how the process is going to work from this point forward. Questions that have been asked by the community that we as a board have and questions that we expect you had considered when you proposed the amendment to the budget last week. We have three primary objectives for this meeting. The first, to gain clarity for the board, the superintendent, and the community as to how the process should work from this point forward including how we set agendas and expectations for meetings that are already on the calendar, for example, the neighborhood outreach meetings as well as the May 1st public hearing. Second objective, um, does the town council in, get answer to the questions, does the town council anticipate providing a bottom line to the school? If so, how and when will that occur? <clears throat> what process will be implemented to allow public participation? And what opportunity will we have prior to second reading to advocate for our programming? And finally, we will re reiterate the FY20 school budget development process to date and moving forward. Given the timing of the amended budget and many unanswered questions, we are not prepared tonight with an amended proposal. Julie will speak to the process up to this point and review the FY20 investment proposals at a high level. However, we did want to share how we as a board plan to proceed, which is no different today than it was a week ago. Most board members have already begun the process of going through the budget line by line. This process will continue between now and April 25th, the date of our next Finance Committee meeting. On April 25th, the Finance Committee will meet with the Superintendent, our Business Manager, and some Department Heads to review the questions that the Board has about budget items and investments, and make decisions on where we could potentially delay spending, <coughs> reallocate funds, and look for items in the capital budget that we can bond rather than appropriate. Although not final, by the 25th, we should also have further updates on the items that are in motion, such as enrollment and benefits packages. After this meeting on the 25th, we should be in a position to share an updated proposal by our town 
uh, school workshop that's scheduled for May 8th. That does bring into question the value of holding the, holding the public hearing on May 1st, which goes back to my original point on needing clarity as to how the process will continue from here. After spending six plus hours with our district leadership council and going through their department proposals in detail, it is our belief that this budget is responsible and addresses the needs of our growing district. In some cases, this budget doesn't go far enough. As a community, we need to have a conversation about who we are and what we value with our public education. This is not a conversation for tonight, but one that we would implore you all to think about if we ever want to evolve our community budget practices and change the dialogue with our constituents. For now, as a board, we are laser focused on FY20 budget and out of respect for the council and the community, we'll do our part to look for areas of adjustments to the original proposal. Our ask back to you is that from this point moving forward, we are seen as a partner in the process and if there are any expectations you have of us that they are clearly defined tonight in public. And with that, I will hand it over to Julie. So just building on that statement um, by finance chair, um, Sarah, we'll start by sharing our objectives for tonight. So we will share, which is now the school board's budget proposal with you. We'll clearly articulate our investment proposals and our budget process. We'll clarify town expectations, and our hope is to also clarify the budget process moving forward. So some of these slides will look familiar to you as you all received all the public presentations that have been done to date last week, um, but we want to make sure that we're reporting the important, repeating the important messages tonight as um, we prepare to answer any questions that you might have regarding our proposal. So here's our, our goals and our, our budget proposal goals. We're really looking to prioritize all of the resources that we have K-12, provide required and appropriate services based on all student needs so that we can encourage the best possible education outcomes for all of our students, intentionally bold in talking about all students. Um, we need to be able to respond to the increasing enrollment demands at K-2. There's a time for us to assess um, and identify what's causing the increase in the enrollment, but the reality is, is that it's coming and uh, we need to be ready. We also need to be able to maintain existing programs and the incremental investments that we have been able to make in order to ensure high quality programs and student safety. There are some um, 21st century programming needs that are necessary for us to meet at the high school, including science, technology, engineering, math, and career education. And you'll also hear us advocating for an HR specialist to support our over 500 plus employees. I think a lot of people in town are surprised to learn that the school department doesn't have a designated HR department. Um, we've been making do with this um, magical unicorn over here sitting next to me for many years. Kate serves as our business manager and our HR person um, as long, along with many other things including she's on the wellness committee and the arts council. Um, it really is unbelievable the work that she does and I think um, noticing her current state has really been an uh, unfortunate reality check for all of us and we want to be able to advocate <coughs> for better support for our employees and more sustainable job description for our business manager. So these are the budget challenges that we knew we were facing going into this budget cycle, which for the school department starts at the end of November. It really never ends, but officially we start putting together our internal calendar at the end of November into early December. Um, it's always a challenge to get to receive the goal of a 3% or less tax rate increase. I think what makes that a challenge is not that we aren't committed to um, working towards that, but realizing that this goal is set well before the needs are fully assessed. And then receiving the uh, proposal amendment last Wednesday obviously poses another layer of challenge for the school department and the town alike. Some other challenges we have are those increasing K-2 enrollments. We have space challenges. We know that we will not currently have enough classrooms at eight corners next year based on just pre-registration numbers, which we'll talk a little bit about. Um, and we can see some other challenges coming down the pike. So we wanna be able to have a multi-year lens as we look at enrollment. We also um, have increasing demands of students coming in with developmental, social, emotional, and behavioral needs, and we need to be able to respond to that in order to best support our staff and our students. And you know, as always, the challenge when budgeting, more needs and investment proposals than we're able to support. And we want 
the community to really understand the amount of effort and work that goes into refining our proposals before we even get to first reading. So not to beat a dead horse, so to speak, but just reinforcing that um, last week we had some clarity around what the proposal was. This week we lack that clarity. And so everything highlighted in yellow is now unknowns. Um, I have bolded the new FY20 total net, the net change um, in dollars and percents at the bottom there. But what we really don't know yet is what is the expectation for the town and school gross budget, which is our expenditures, um, and then how will that impact the net, which for the school department includes our non-tax revenues, which certainly um, we aren't a huge generator of non-tax revenues, um, so there's not often a big change between our gross and our net budget, but this is the first year in a number of years that our net budget is actually lower than our gross budget because um, we do continue to be minimum receivers but um, no longer have that revenue gap to fill, which is exciting news for us. So just a, one thing that I've been hearing in the community is that somehow like the school has received this big windfall from the state because we, are, um, we did receive additional GPA this year, which is general purpose aid, which is the funding that the state allocates to support our budget. <coughs> Although it is higher than it was last year, it's important for the community and the finance committee to understand that we are still minimum receivers. Um, the reason that we saw an increase this year was because one calculation that is used in determining that allocation, the adjusted allocation, I should say, is um, the a percentage of our special education costs. Last year, in FY19, it was 40% of our special education costs from two years prior. This year, it was 45% of our special education costs two years prior. So knowing that the cost of educating children goes up each year and also knowing that there's a 5% increase in that um, adjusted allocation is the real explanation for why Scarborough received 621,000 additional dollars in the GPA formula. If we did not receive that special ed adjustment, we would still be, re we would be receiving just 1.7 million. So thank goodness for that. Um, that part of the law that it brings our adjustment up to 3.283 and um, 11. It becomes 3.3 after you add in the additional um, revenue that Scarborough will be awarded if and only if our community members vote yes to join the regional service center. So this is a conversation we, we need to continue to have. Our communications committee is um, committed to reminding the community of this. It will be question one. Um, and we ask folks to, to really think hard about this. It's a win-win, win all around for us. Um, this literally is $83,000 outside of the formula, which means that if, this, if it was the way the formula was two years ago, this would get lost in, in, the minimum, in the GPA funding formula and we would still be minimum receivers and we wouldn't be seeing this. This truly is uh, an incentive for us because it's outside of that. The other thing I would add is that it only costs us $1,000 to be a member of the Greater Sebago Education Alliance. Um, we are one of the actual co-founders, so the irony that our community is the last one to approve this um, is not lost on us. Also, what this allows us to do is, is find shared service opportunities throughout the year, such as um, you know, potential cost savings with professional development and food purchasing through a co-op. Um, we're also looking at English language learner services and other ways that we can streamline our efforts as a region. So the, there's only more opportunity for us to find efficiencies and increase our effectiveness by being a member of this. If we don't say yes, if our community doesn't vote yes on this, um, in June, our budget will be decreased automatically by 83,000. Um, so it, it truly is important. So this is our proposed budget at first reading. And um, just to kind of bring folks through, what you see up top there is our general fund operating budget. We also have an adult education budget and a school nutrition budget that um, doesn't go to the voters um, in the same way that the operating budget does. And so the total education budget is shown there. And you see that... Um, expenditure amount as a 6.35% increase. We add in our non-tax revenues, which is that 3.3 million from the state and general purpose aid. That's also fund balance and um, some of the user fees that we collect. 
few state revenues as well. And a, and a few GPA. state revenues as well that are non-GPA. Um, so that brings the school portion of the tax request to 5.71%. Um, and for all the counselors who have, have been a part of this process, and I know certainly for our finance committee, this is a lower ask than last year in terms of our net tax ask and lower than the previous year. In fact, I think it might be the lowest it's been in the last couple of years. Um, so I point that out to say this isn't an outrageous, um, an outrageous request. And we know that this is only our portion that then gets combined with the town's tax request and divided by the value of our whole town to get to that 3% or less goal. So at first reading, we're really taking our best attempt at um, doing our part, which since I came to Scarborough, I have always been told that if the town comes in between um, 2 and 4% and the school comes in between 4 and 6%, depending on which combination of those numbers, we will get to that 3% or less tax rate goal. Um, so we feel that this very much delivers on our, our commitment toward that effort. So just a high-level view, I won't read all of these numbers to you, but um, just to restate what I think is a known fact, um, our biggest piece of our pie, so here's our whole budget, is 79.1% is salary, wages, and benefits. We are a human-based organization where we employ humans, we support humans to grow and develop humans. Um, and so it, doesn't, it makes sense that human resources is our biggest investment. The next big slice there is debt service. And then um, to those wondering if we've looked for efficiencies within our line items, just take a close look at our supplies and equipment there. Um, you can see both for support and instructional, we're at around 2.2% of our total budget. So what the, what the re this is really the result of um, the last couple of years, at least while I've been here, really going through line by line. Um, questioning every investment that we're making and refining it as closely as we can um, while still executing on our mission. So then when we take that big piece of the pie and we look at, okay, so of all the personnel, so we have over 500 employees, um, about 315 of our employees are what we call teachers and professionals, so these are all of our certified staff. And then our next largest group is our ed support staff, our IT staff, um, athletics and activity staff as a small slice there, bus drivers as 2.9% um, of our staff, custodians, school administration and support staff, and then district administration and support staff. So that gives you the breakdown of our largest investment and our most valuable investment, our human resources. So another thing we work really hard to do on the school department, because we don't have a lot of capacity to generate revenue, we rely heavily on families to support our programs um, by creating some required contributions. So we have activities fees, sports fees, um, club fees, parking fees, laptop fees, field trip fees. Um, in a lot of ways, you know, our parents are kind of getting double taxed. They pay their local property tax, um, which we know a large portion goes to the schools, and then they pay all of these other ancillary fees in order to um, engage in the programming that we offer. Some are a choice and some are not a choice, um, such as the laptop fees. We also rely heavily on community support programs and voluntary efforts. We're so thankful for the Scarborough Ed Foundation that literally contributes thousands of dollars to our organization every year, providing innovation grants to our teachers so that when we can't make new investments, they still have hope and inspiration and they're empowered to think outside of the box and come up with new ideas and that's supported through CEF or the Scarborough Ed Foundation. Um, we have an Arts Council Trust, which is the, the sole reason we were able to bring the art show back last year was from that funding. Our school business partnerships, who are um, primarily thought partners and also create opportunities for our kids, both inside our school and outside of our school. Fundraising, um, anyone who knows a parent who's a part of a booster group or the PTO knows that they generate thousands and thousands of dollars for our schools each year. A lot of people are surprised to know that booster groups bring in anywhere from three to $500,000 a year, depending on um, how successful their fundraising efforts are, and they fund a lot of basic, fundamental safety and um, program materials and equipment. 
local grants and donations. We're always looking for um, as many grants as we can qualify for. And of course, a lot of volunteer hours, which aren't as easy to quantify in dollars, but we wouldn't be able to do what we do without our volunteers. So just some of our creative funding sources, not an exhaustive list for sure. So the tricky part about first reading um, in this time of year is that we still have a lot of items in motion. Um, I put back up there the Regional Service Center membership because, again, that has a price tag of an $80,000, $83,000 add to our district or not, um, and that's really up to our voters for that. We're still waiting on some insurance premiums to come in. Um, I will update you on Delta and Anthem in the next slide. We are um, working diligently with um, Child Development Services to understand the needs of our incoming students in terms of special education um, services that they may require, and our kindergarten enrollment is well underway. Um, kudos to our primary school principals who have really amplified the pre-registration process. So I think part of, um, part of the reason why we are able to project so clearly for the fall is that they have really pushed parents pre-registering um, starting as early as I think late February, early March this year. And so we feel like we have a good solid handle on the numbers, but we know that we can anticipate about a 10 to 15% increase in current pre-registrations. And we have not yet had our parent information night. So that also kind of gets people talking and generates um, some motivation for people to come in and register. Our high school is currently um, getting ready to launch course enrollment as soon as the students come back from break. We're watching closely STEM, which is that science, technology, engineering, and math course offerings, um, and world language. We know that last year we had to turn some students away from some courses in chemistry, biology, and in physics because we didn't have enough um, staff to offer the um, adequate number of sections, and we're hoping uh, with this budget proposal to be able to change that narrative a bit. And we've been working now, um, this is our second year with one of our world language teachers splitting her time between teaching world language um, and uh, really leading and navigating and charting the path for our careers pathway and career education work that we've been trying to build. This is the third year in a row that we'll be asking for that and you'll see that in our proposals. We also have some unexpected special education costs outside of what we know and control. Um, main care, that is a, a parent choice whether or not they are um, taking advantage of that. And when they say no thank you, that falls um, on the responsibility of the district to pick up those costs. CDS, again, that's that early intervention child development services. So incoming students all drives our staffing needs um, and can um, lead to some adjustments both increasing the budget or decreasing the budget. And then collective bargaining is in process. This year we are um, in the process of negotiating our largest collective bargaining agreement, which is with that teachers and professional group that you saw the biggest piece of the pie when we really honed in on personnel. Um, so we need to be prepared to respond to that and allow for fair um, bargaining. So three quick updates for you. Um, this really go is kudos to our business manager, Kate Bolton, and her ability to um, come up with a really accurate system for our budget forecasting. So Kate had budgeted 7% increase for Anthem premiums in the FY20 budget, and they came in at 6.72%. So not a big uh, savings for us, but it does reduce our proposal by 15372 Delta Dental, um, we budgeted at 4%, and it has been confirmed at 3.84%, $283 reduction to the budget. <laughs> um, but we'll take any reduction we can find. And then Unified Basketball, we've worked closely um, with our athletic director to really go back to the proposal, which is a normal part of the process from first reading <coughs> to second, to refine um, the ask. And so we've reduced that ask down to 7,070. Um, really, this is just um, based primarily on looking at the way we were using the rubric for assessing the coach stipends. Um, and we already know that um, Mike Legage, our athletic director, has applied for a grant through Special Olympics for $2,500. And we're 99% confident. We've been given that confidence that um, we will receive that grant in the fall. So um, moving forward with unified basketball, even though it was articulated as an unmet need at first reading. 
again, just a real life example of how things can change from first reading to second reading. So one of our big budget drivers is our incoming kindergarten um, population, both in terms of the sheer number of students who we anticipate coming, but also the needs of those students who are coming to us. So this chart here is a really simplistic way to look at our current enrollment. So you can see it there across our three primary schools. Um, and at Blue Point, we currently have three kindergarten classes. At Eight Corners, we currently have four. And at Pleasant Hill, we currently have four. So I'll let you do the quick math to figure out those class sizes. Um, but we have 207 kindergartners currently as of last month enrolled. Our pre-registration is panning out as you see there. We already are exceeding our current enrollment um, by 16 students. And our projections show us um, receiving an additional 32 students across the K-2s. Um, and so again, if you take those numbers, 74 divided by 3, how many kids does that put in a class? 89 divided by 4, 76 divided by 4, we get up to class sizes of 22, 24 in kindergarten, and um, those are not class sizes that we're comfortable with, and we certainly do not expect or think that our community will accept that either. Um, so you'll see an ask for some K2, K2 teachers. We do know, and I say today, this was actually um, last week was the last update I had, that we had 34 incoming kindergarten students who we knew were going, who we know will require specialized services. This is the highest number Scarborough has ever seen um, in its history. And this is really a national trend. There's nothing unique or special. Um, well, there's lots of unique and special things about Scarborough, but not in terms of this um, data point. Um, my colleagues across the country are seeing the same thing. <coughs> Students are coming in with more and more um, increasing needs and demands. And we need to be able to respond to that. So one of the things that we've talked a lot about is um, how, how are these increasing enrollments really affecting our budget? And so what I did was go through and look at our operating budget, mostly just honing in on the new investments, and then looking at our capital improvement, um, our capital improvement projects, and try to quantify for you exactly what this growth means to the school department. And again, we're not determining or evaluating what the result of the growth is. The reality is, is that it's happening and the kids are coming. Um, and so what I did, and, and I will also add here that this is not a pure formula. There are lots of imperfections in this analysis. This was really just um, an exercise for us to be able to reflect and think and ask questions. Um, so in the new investment proposal that you have, which is this chart here, you'll see that there's the level services and then there's the adjusted level services. And then on the second page, there's a pink box, which is called required investments. And so these are all of the things that we have to implement based on what we know of our incoming student population above what already exists in our level services budget. And so this is just a small portion of, of special education costs, truly new investments. Um, and this number that you see in that pink box is 629000 what I'm doing here for the sake of this exercise is, is saying, okay, if we didn't have so many more kindergarten students coming, would we need that additional special ed teacher? So I'm minusing out here the 80,000 for that teacher. I did the same with two of the special education technicians. So you see that we're asking for nine. And again, this is based on what we know currently. This is where the formula becomes really imperfect, is I don't know, would we have the same needs coming in if we had fewer students coming in? That's impossible for me to determine. Um, so I err on the side of caution with a conservative estimate of 90,000. Then we eliminate the K-2 investment. If you flip over to the next page, um, you'll see that we're asking for three K-2 teachers based on those enrollment numbers that I just showed you. When you add a new classroom, um, or two, you then have to balance out and make sure you have enough um, sessions available in art, music, PE. And currently our art teacher at one of the K2s is just a .4. So if we added a class, um, we would have to increase that by one day. And then a building ed tech, again, that's designed to support the incoming population. When you add three classrooms, you then have to add three 
uh, enough supplies, and these are just consumable classroom supplies, and that's 3,000 per classroom, so paper, glue, scissors, markers, crayons, that kind of um, basic supply stuff. For a total of estimated um, impact, 480,000 in just the operating budget. Of course, then you need space in classrooms. Um, I feel like I'm telling, like, a, if you give a mouse a cookie story here, for those of you who, <laughs> who know that book. Um, but if you, once you add the teachers, you have to have a space for them to go. Or in our case, we've agreed to add the classrooms, so now we need the teachers to fill the classrooms, um, because you all approved that for us um, last week in terms of the eight corners modulars. So what we will need to do is bring a classroom back online at eight corners, or I'm sorry, at Blue Point, bring a classroom back online that hasn't been used as a classroom at Pleasant Hill to adjust to the enrollment needs. And then the two classrooms that will be the modular classrooms you approved for next year through school impact fees. And then in our capital budget, you'll see an additional two to prepare for FY21. So that's, that's the six classroom number. Um, and so this is the new tech equipment. As you know, we're a one-to-one -one district, and so we need to have devices for those students in those classes. Um, we also then need to um, add a switch, and this is a, if you look in the capital improvement um, uh, budget, you'll see that this is a multi-year plan. We're just adding one this year. We anticipate adding one next year and the year after to address the network capacity issues. Um, the four classrooms here, uh, total is 320. Don't worry, we're gonna subtract two of those classrooms later on. Um, and then the new furnishings. This is the tables, the chairs, the cubbies, um, the hooks, the places for their things, their little things to go in those classrooms. Um, in, in the Blue Point classroom, all of those things have been removed to make a, a safe space for a student, and so we will need to be able to add those things back. And the same is true at Pleasant Hill. There's some um, work that will need to be done to that room because it hasn't been used as a classroom for quite some time. Um, and then the site work to prep to receive the modulars, and so that's the asphalt pad. So that totals 632 1,240 of what you see in this budget proposal. Um, we're taking out the approval of the school impact fees from that CIP. Um, so that gets us to a total between the operating and the CIP um, of 852,240 that I think we could fairly and honestly assign to increasing enrollment needs at the K-2s alone. Um, so when you think about our overall budget increase this year, I ask that you keep that number in mind. And so this is the part we like to celebrate. And last year we really did, um, a, a, we had a concerted effort to adjust our language because we wanted folks to have something to come out and vote for. Um, we know that when it comes to a budget as large as ours, there's always things that people will not like about the budget, but I believe that there's also things that you could like about the budget. And so this is our effort to highlight what could you come out and vote for above and beyond the great service that you already receive from the Scarborough Public Schools. Um, so these are all of our investments that are outlined in this document above the red line. Um, articulated in words so that folks could see both the, the cost of that and what the return on that investment would be. Um, and we tried to really focus on um, highlighting that verb. So responding to the incoming needs. Again, if you're looking at this document, that's the pink required investments. Um, we don't have a choice. So if our budget were to be, if our final bottom line were to be lower than what it asks for here, it would push other things out that are current services within our organization to make that happen. That's not a choice. Um, <coughs> the next is the transportation, um, I forget what we're calling it here, the office support for transportation. This became the number one priority in our leadership council analysis of our investment proposals. This year we were able to get a small taste of the value of having someone in the office at the transportation department answering the phone. Um, we haven't had that for a number of years. It existed, I think, a decade ago, um, or maybe eight years ago. Um, we haven't had that, and it's been solely our transportation supervisor. However, given the shortage of bus drivers, she's been on the road every morning and every afternoon. So imagine being a parent, picking up the phone to call 
um, about a concern and have no one answer your call. Mm -hmm. That's what a lot of our families and our principals were experiencing. Um, this year, by testing that out with a substitute, we saw the value and it became our number one investment. The second one is little money, but it matters a lot. I can promise you to our teachers, this is something we heard loud and clear from our Wentworth School um, staff that they really have felt stretched thin um, when it comes to just general supplies. They don't know they they don't know um, what they have access to. And when we looked at their budget, we found that there was disproportionality between what we were allocating for Wentworth um, versus what we were allocating for the other schools. So we did an analysis, and this little um, micro investment here is going to mean a lot to those teachers and students at Wentworth School. The next one, if you're following the chart along with me, um, talks about those K-2 teachers that we need um, to respond to the demands of the growth that we're experiencing. Um, and also, as you're going through the, the top number, as, uh, I know you guys have heard me present this, but the top mm -hmm. number shows you the gross impact, and the bottom number shows you the net impact, um, if you're following along with that. For the third time in a row, third year in a row, we're asking to expand our career exploration opportunities and support workforce development through this career pathways position. As I mentioned earlier, we currently have been um, testing that out and piling it out with a .5 FTE. Um, and we believe that we to really serve our student population well, we need that to be a 1.0 position. Um, this is something that we are required to be providing our students. It's not a nice to or, um, you know, somehow Scarborough is exceeding the norm. We're, we're really like a decade behind when it comes to doing this work in our schools, um, and we uh, believe that the time is now for us to make the full investment. We also currently have a targeted fundraising effort through SEDCO, in partnership with SEDCO and SETH, the Scarborough Ed Foundation, trying to generate additional funds to provide supplies and transportation for that career exploration work. The next investment that you see here um, above the red line is a um, 1.0 FTE at the Middle School Academic Center, and this is really staff reallocation. We have a retirement where we're reallocating 0.5 of that position and reassigning an ed tech salary position to make a 1.0 teaching position. And what this allow this will allow us to do is to really address the needs in a, in a much more proactive way, but also reactive way for students who are at risk due to transitions, whether it be um, they're transitioning into our district or they have school avoidance or they have some medical challenges that don't allow them to attend school regularly. This bridge program really helps us close the gap and keep them on pace for success. The next um, investment that we're really excited about is developing the high school technology and engineering classes based on student needs and interests. And so just a quick analysis, um, Principal Ketch was able to go through and look at all of the current enrollments in our science, um, technology, engineering, math courses, and then also able to project what the impact would be if we didn't make this investment this year versus um, if we do make it this year. And we know, as I said last year, we had to, um, we couldn't offer some, some sections of some courses. Next year, we're projected to need two to three more biology sections and two to three more sections in physics, oceanography, and um, one other thing that's slipping my memory off the top of my head. And it would allow us to maintain 12 sections of chemistry, which is what we're currently offering. Um, and as you know, this is one of the most demanding fields, so we have students who are very interested in engaging in these courses, and we want to make sure that we have high-quality offerings for them. The last thing that um, this budget proposal allows people to get behind and support is that HR specialist position. Again, I think this is a no-brainer um, for anybody who <coughs> works in the business world. I think you'd be hard-pressed, or public schools for that matter, hard-pressed to find an organization of our size that doesn't have an HR department. Um, we don't have one staff member who's solely designated to HR support, and um, we don't think that that's good enough for Scarborough, and it's certainly not good enough for our employees and our staff. We also have concerns about sustainability, um, having one person being the keeper of all the knowledge and all of the, the resources, as great as this one person is here sitting to my right, is certainly not smart or sustainable. So that's what's above the red line, if you will. That's all of the things that are in our proposal. I'm not going to go through tonight all the things that are not in the proposal. The next slide outlines some of them. 
Um, we categorize these as unmet needs because that's just what they are. And um, we've been working to simplify our language. We choose to only highlight um, now seven unmet needs here, but um, if you've looked at the whole proposal, you know that there's more than seven. Um, we won't get into all that detail tonight. But the, the purpose of us communicating unmet needs in this way is really to put the community on notice and to build that narrative so that you can see that we're looking forward um, and these are things that we know we may not be able to ask for this year or we might be able to, through refinements between first and second reading, make some of these things happen. Um, but we certainly want folks to know that we're thinking about them and we value them. So really coming to the end of my portion to talk at you, these are some of the questions that we have together um, as a finance and a school department, as a finance committee and a school department that I believe Sarah will share. So I'll just reiterate them. Uh, I've mentioned these in my opening statement, but uh, these are questions that hopefully we can have dialogue about and leave here tonight with some answers. Um, so how will the FY20 budget process work moving forward? Do you anticipate providing a bottom line to the school department? If so, how and when? What process will be implemented to allow for public participation? What, process, uh, what opportunity will we have prior to second reading to advocate for our programming? And what will be the format of the public hearing? That's okay. it from us. Excellent. Mm -hmm. um, before we get to that part, if you don't mind, I'd like to open it up to questions regarding the educational presentation. Yeah. Um, for council, for committee members, if you have any, um, any questions. Yeah, I had, a, I had uh, just a, a request, and I've noticed this uh, and a number of the presentations, but wherever we do a percentage on a pie chart or wherever, uh, and we show cost numbers, where they involve headcount, and we do headcount totals as well. I mean, I, it's just helpful for us to get an idea of what average costs are, and I've noticed throughout both presentations that that's something that we, we don't do as a rule, and I think that would be very useful for all of us as we're looking at ways to try to you know, manage costs. Um, so I want to thank uh, you know Julie and the team for uh, you know their constructive uh, work and comments and questions, uh, refreshing and reassuring. Thank you, uh, and a little bit in contrast to some of the email traffic that we had over the weekend and week, but thank you for that. Um, one one thing that strikes me in general is that I know um, you know this is a tough list, right? These things look like they're they are, uh, you know, uh, must-haves. You know, they are the things we uh, can't do without. Um, but I was working through some of the numbers and looking at some things, and um, are, are there ways to, you know, are there any efficiencies internally? And I know some areas you've identified them, but, for example, we're looking at some of the enrollment data, it looks like we're light in the high school in terms of... Uh, our average class sizes are far below uh, projections. Uh, you know, they're in the teens. Is there any opportunity, uh, and maybe I'm, you know, displaying my ignorance about education, but is, is there any way that we can leverage uh, our human capital in terms of redeployment or getting really creative about uh, reassigning uh, educational staff to, mm -hmm. to elementary level? I mean, uh, that sort of thing. So excellent question. Um, that's actually one of the things I think is m exciting to look at in the budget process. And we actually start our budget process with personnel. That's the very first part of the conversation we have with our full leadership council. We look at enrollment projections, current enrollment, enrollment projections. We look at course enrollment. Um, we look at where people are in their cycles of evaluation and um, who's probationary and who's continuing contract. It's it really it's like a two or three meeting um, process, and then we talk about you know where can we make some adjustments. We we don't just want to keep adding to the top, and in fact. Probably at nauseum, I say to my staff, you know, we need to make sure that we're solving the right problem and more people doesn't always solve the problem. Sometimes that creates more of a problem. So absolutely, I think um, the difference here this year, if you, in, in last year, I almost brought it down. The one pager that we created last year had a chart that this one doesn't, which was reductions. And so for the last two years, actually, Wentworth um, and middle school have been seeing a decline in enrollment, and we've adjusted accordingly to that. 
Um, we have one more adjustment to make at the middle school as that retirement is happening to, to right size that position, if you will. But only, to, only temporary, because we know that then as these K-2 students come back up through the grades, we're going to have to then adjust um, staffing there. And so it's a philosophical decision. Do you shrink every time enrollment decreases and then look to hire new staff every time um, yeah. it expands? And you know, for us, we haven't had a choice because of our fiscal reality. We've had to be as tight as we can. The thing about high school that's different, and I say, um, I, I say this sometimes that I think if it was safe for children, everyone should teach kindergarten. Um, but the reality is that not everyone is a kindergarten teacher. And you certainly wouldn't want to take a high school teacher, not saying that some couldn't, and just um, put them down into a primary grade because there's an enrollment need, not to mention their certification requirements and all of that. Um, so it's not that easy. Um, and we do also within our collective bargain agreement, there are certain rules about how staff can be assigned and reassigned dependent upon their certification and their current work um, assignment. So to that, and then the other piece of that is how come we see class sizes of 13 at Scarborough High School? The other day, I was in an AP Latin class, and this could make some people's hearts stop, but there were seven students in the class. Mm. Now, could a couple have been absent? Maybe. Um, but some of our higher level courses have lower enrollment um, just because there isn't the student interest or um, ability to fill that class. But we still should be running those courses. Um, and so that's why you see such a wide range at the high school. But I also would share that I think I was in seven classrooms the other day. I saw class sizes of 22, 24, 18. Um, and so it really just depends on the level of the course um, and the interest inability of, of students to assign to sign up for it. So it's not as easy as K-2 enrollment where you can literally say 80 divided by 4. That's 20 students in a class. It doesn't work that way at the high school. One other question, um, and it, it's along the same theme of, uh, you know, looking at the, at the work that, the core work that the school is doing, you know, providing education, providing special needs. With, with the dramatically increasing demand. So I was just playing with the numbers here a little bit, and so it's uh, up 34 people in kindergarten, and there's a cost associated, adjusted, I guess, about 850,000, something like that, or, or roughly 25,000 per, per student in those grades. Is that a, what kind of number is that? Is that a good number, uh, a number we should feel comfortable with? Is it, you know, is it average? Do you have any, is there any sense of whether that's good, bad, or indifferent in terms, other than it being an incremental expense we've got to deal with? Right. So I think that's a dangerous calculation. Yeah. Um, because it's not, it, it, I mean, we do calculate, we do generate a per pupil cost each year. Scarborough um, tends to be on the lower side of that. And um, Kate has done a multi-year analysis, breaking it down by each of our voter categories. Um, so you can see exactly where we fall. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's if if you're going to say twenty five thousand dollars per student, that sounds like a lot. But on average, we spend about fifteen thousand dollars per student across the district, mm -hmm. and um, it's it's a little bit more complex the way we calculate that. Great. Well, I would say. Oh, can I add something? I would say when we did that number, part of that cost was the startup cost for yeah. those classrooms. And right. so that also would, okay. it, would have inflated that okay. number, right? Because right. that, that yeah. wouldn't roll. Once right. they're furnished, they're furnished. Right. For example. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So the last thing I'd like to say, thanks very much. This is very helpful. Give me a handle on a couple of key points. Uh, and I don't know if this is the sort of input you're, you know, you're looking for, if it's helpful or not, or, or that's what you had in mind in terms of uh, a start here. But one appeal I would make is that, uh, you know, I, it's pretty clear that in the past couple of months, we've been surprised by enrollment numbers, and it's given us a feeling that uh, we really don't have our arms around this, or, or you know, really don't have a handle of, of the, rate, the rate at which it's ramping and how we're going to get our arms around it. In that environment, the only thing I'd say, and this is an appeal uh, to our collective uh, uh, firepower in terms of our intellectual <coughs> capital, but how do we get our arms around this? Uh, as a group of smart, dedicated people to solve. Mm -hmm. and, and I would suggest it's going to require that we make some tough decisions on things that, have, that are big drivers in our cost structure. You know, we're, we are a bus company. 
We are a food service provider. We are a, a landlord. We are a, a building maintenance company. These are things that are part of our services that we provide as a school and, and also as a municipality. Do we have any business being in those businesses? So I would just, you know, that's the kind of thing that, uh, and I know some of these things are, are, uh, are considered uh, untouchable, but I think in the environment that we're in, we're really gonna have to think outside the box and get creative and uh, work with one another and figure out some, some approaches that might give us more room. Yeah, I, I mean, I would have to say that I'm, the enrollment numbers are not a surprise to us at all in the school department. We've been talking about this since the day I was hired, it feels like. Um, we've engaged in a lot of analysis and, and have been trying to say it's coming, it's coming, and we, don't, we can't respond quickly. Um, this is not the way we want to respond um, to increasing enrollment demands. So we have a really great study that is hot off the press, January 2019. I think you know having a really deep dive into that that, that those enrollment numbers, we've already started that, but I know that long range planning um, under Nick's direction as the chair of that committee is committed to getting folks together and hearing a lot of voices and coming up with a more sustainable long term solution. And so just to give a little confidence that work is well underway. Um, and to the, are we prepared to be or are we equipped to be a food service, medical professional, all these things, I would say, yeah, I mean, we're a community. So this is what we do. We serve our, our community members. And I think what we need to focus on is how are we going to do that in a really positive and productive way and truly understand the commitment that we have as a community um, and what our priorities are, to Sarah's point that she said earlier. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I did want to, uh, a couple of things. So I got like five questions. Um, I did want to mention, because I didn't do it in the beginning like I promised. and so. I just want to reference, first, I, I want to say thank you um, for another excellent presentation. Um, but for the public is that um, we as a council, as well as you as a school board, are directed by state law first and then town charter and then by, for us, council rules about um, uh, the budget process. And so I want, I hope people understand that it is a, um, it's wonderful that you provide us with and inform us and educate us around the educational programmatic level. But I hope people understand is that it's not our responsibility mm -hmm. to question the individual line or the services that you decide that our students need. So um, I've got a couple of specific questions. So sure. I want you, I just want to be informed because uh, it kind of ties into a little bit on the state side of what I'm working with. Um, but first, if I can ask the town manager regarding the HR position that you're asking, um, on the town side, how many employees do we have? And because we do have an HR department on the town side, how many employees do we have? Three full time. Three full-time um, employees in HR. Yes. Uh, taking care of how many employees? 165 full-time, and uh, it's almost 500 part-time seasonal. Mm -hmm. So six. So three people taking care of 600, and the school's asking for one additional person to take care of 500. So I just wanted to put it into perspective to services we're already providing on the town site. The second question I have is around, um, can you explain or provide any detail around the introduction of pre-K? Um, and if our district is addressing that, because I know that there's some legislative action mm -hmm. that are looking to increase funding to 50% to those who opt in. Um, it's not a mandate, but if you want to opt in, are we looking at pre-K? We currently are not looking at pre-K. We do have a pre-K task force that was formed last year um, in the FY19 cycle and um, kind of took a pause in the spring, realizing that this wasn't going to be a priority for us. It's unfortunate because there is some funding available that we're missing out on, but mm -hmm. with our space limitations, um, it really would be a challenge for us. We have looked at could we generate a public-private partnership, um, and really my understanding is that there's only one um, preschool provider in town that is accredited, and that's a requirement for a public school to be able to work with that, with an accredited, or with a private preschool. And my understanding is also that they pretty routinely have a wait list. So really for us to be able to do that, we would need more building capacity and space. And the reason why I'm bringing it up, it's more about long range planning. Mm -hmm. Because um, generally planning. speaking, I think that it's fair to say that when the legislature or the state contemplates new approaches to education, it eventually becomes a mandate. They don't like making it a mandate because then there is a 
a, um, there is a requirement, at least in the beginning, to fund, I think it's 90% of the program that they mandate, yeah. which they don't have. Right. So I just think that we need to be aware that it's probably coming down the road quicker Absolutely. than people think, um, which then kind of blows everything out of the water. And when you look at our unmet needs, that doesn't even make the quantified list, mm -hmm. if you will, on the last page of that um, chart, you'll see that um, we're saying there's, you know, we're going to need some, to take, start taking some incremental steps towards a pre-K initiative, um, right here on the last page. The other thing that's shocking to know is that 70% of the school districts in Maine already have some form of pre-K. That astonished me when I um, first started looking into this for Scarborough. Um, so uh, the other question I had was, um, so you mentioned about that last year was all that one page was about reductions. I actually want to give you better credit because I think it was more about reallocation mm -hmm. of resources that align to an educational plan. So how does this budget move us forward in that educational plan? Does it get us to 50%? Does it get us to 75? Will, will you have succeeded in implementing it fully? Um, wh where are we in that? Uh, I honestly believe that this budget begins to scratch the surface on some of the critical needs that we have. Um, there is nothing really innovative in this budget proposal. Um, with that being said, knowing that our existing staff are always trying to think of ways to improve and um, our district goals are around that continuous improvement process. So, but not all of those things cost money directly. It's about how do we use the resources that we have. So in terms of like a percentage towards that goal, I don't know that I could accurately quantify that. I think you did, at least in my head. Okay. It's very low, <laughs> very low. Um, I think that's all I have to do. Just, just two quick things. One, I thought I was following you, but I may have gotten confused. The 83,000, which is for the per, is that in the numbers or out of the numbers at this point? It's in the numbers. It's in the it numbers. will come out of the numbers. Okay. If anything like last time, I don't even think our votes were certified before the state sent me a letter saying we'll be taking that money back. <laughs> so, so it's in the budget. It's in the budget. Right. Then the other thing you said, because it, it's more just personal for me, is just when you said there's a record number of, of students with special needs, did I hear you say at one point or, or in part of the conversation that we think that's related to opioids use and those I, types of things or don't we know? I would not be able to say that conclusively. Um, I don't know the specific needs of incoming students. I know that nationally we're in the well, midst of an opioid crisis and also we know that um, we're not alone in seeing students coming in with increasing demands. The other things that um, I would assume are factors in that, but again would want to be much more specific, are um, you know students are being diagnosed earlier. Parents are, when they see that their young child is having a speech delay or a language delay, they're not waiting to see if they, um, they're, they're going to their pediatrician and they're getting intervention and support, which is a good thing. Um, we all know that early intervention is much more effective for positive life outcomes and also much more cost effective in the context of our budget conversation. So I think there's multiple factors and I wouldn't want to um, make any assumptions or um, overgeneralize. Just another hat that I wear, just in the healthcare employers are mm -hmm. really, really feeling the impact. Yeah, yeah. So. I heard, um, <clears throat> not that this is necessarily our incoming students, but this is literally something that keeps me up at night. And I was talking with Leanne about this the other day is just the level of anxiety and stress that our students are under, but also our staff is under. Mm -hmm. And the other day on NPR, there was a story, I think they said Maine is like leading the country mm -hmm. in the number of students, young people being diagnosed with anxiety. Mm -hmm. and, um, really, I think, like third in depression. Mm -hmm. So I think that's uh, part of a bigger conversation as a community mm -hmm. that we really need to look at kind of what are our expectations and how are we supporting our people. Yeah, I have a senior going through college missions right now. That's, they're not, those kids are really stressed. Mm -hmm. It's really it's remarkable in a really not process. great way. Yeah. 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 Anything else? No. No. Um, so uh, with that, what I'd like to do is actually open it up to uh, questions first from councilors that are here, just so that people know the reason why I'm doing it in this process is that I, I believe that councilors should make their questions and, as well as comments known before. That way the public can actually take that into consideration when they make theirs, and that's why I kind of structure that. So I'll turn it over to uh, 
The first speaker, Councilor Caterina. Thank you very much. Uh, again, I'm Jean Marie Caterina, and I'm here as a town councilor, not as a, a resident. And so my questions uh, relate to things related to council. Um, and my first question, and, and uh, Mr. Babine um, sort of asked it, but I want to throw it out there also, is can the HR functions be shared with town council? Is there some way of blending them? I don't know if we can or can't. Um, and then in your number, you had 9.4% of uh, admin and support. Um, and is there some way of splitting out the admin only? And the reason I ask for that is because I know in past budget cycles, people get all wound up thinking we've got, we're real high on admin costs, and we aren't. And I would like to be able to delineate that further for people. Um, and then the last one's for just personal. I think it's awesome that we have seven people in AP Latin. It's formal Latin. <laughs> sure that's actually a huge number of students <laughs> taking advanced placement Latin. Uh, so I think that's a good thing. <laughs> Um, um, Mr. Chair, do I have, can I make some comments? Absolutely. General, um, as, as people probably noted, uh, I was not here on Wednesday evening. I had long ago planned uh, a trip to visit my uh, sister in South Carolina. Uh, and a lot has happened since I left town. I guess I'm not going to be able to leave town much anymore, particularly in budget season. Um, I thought it was a first reading. And to me, a first reading is when the uh, town manager and the superintendent, along with the school board and town council, present the budget. And you come up with a number. Uh, and we've had meetings prior to that saying we'd like to see it committed a certain number, because obviously if you don't sort, sort, I can't even talk, set some sort of goal, uh, then you can end up anywhere. Uh, so with that being said, um, I was pleased when I saw the numbers that originally came in because, as Superintendent Kuvenberg pointed out, this was a really low number coming in from the school board on the first run. I remember the first year I was on the town council, I believe we had superintendent presented, I think it was a 12%, 10 or 12% um, mm -hmm. budget increase, and I was like, whoa, no way. Um, and before leaving, I was assured by town, some town councilors to whom I talked that there, was be, there would be no tabling of first reading. Because I had been hearing through the grapevine that, uh, oh yeah, we're going to have this table and we're going to come back because, you know, we're, we're not happy that people didn't come in at 3% from the start, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and um, I was assured by some of the counselors with whom I was able to connect, that was the day before I left, that was Tuesday, oh no, there'll be no tabling. Um, not one person mentioned this particular amendment, uh, except I will say for Mr. Hamill, who did, when I talked to him, said, no, I, I think there's going to be an amendment presented, um, but he didn't give me the wording of the amendment. Um, and I know I had a discussion with him and with a couple other people that I strongly recommended doing, you know, what we do is you present, the budget comes before us, it is what it is, we, we vote it in as first reading, and then we get to work on adjustments. And I hate to call them cuts, I hate to call them whatever because it's adjustments in my mind. So, that being said, um, I was 30,000 feet in the air when I saw the amendment come through, because I'm one of these nuts who's on Wi-Fi and doing my work while I'm uh, flying. And um, I was like, whoa. So we now have a budget uh, with line items that don't add up to the total, which is sort of like, I didn't do very well in accounting in college. I mean, I just didn't. It just didn't, wasn't my thing. But this just doesn't make sense to me. Um, to me, the effect is to draw a red line in the sand, which is like waving a red flag in front of a bull. So even though the intent may have been to uh, keep down the, you know, the rhetoric and the tone and whatever, I think it's raised it again. Just it's caused it to go from one side now to the other. Um, so I was I was frustrated with that. Um, to me, um, public budgeting, unlike private business budgeting is to take recommendations from those in the know 
and you adjust it to a figure that does the least harm, and that's the bottom line. You want the least harm done um, on all sides. I feel the process was ignored. I feel that all stakeholders should have an opportunity to weigh in, and in, in essence, that's been stripped away, or it feels that way to most people who emailed me or talked to me. Um, bottom line is the town council through the gentlemen here on the finance committee are the ones who make the ultimate decisions based on adjustments um, that have been proposed by constituents, whatever, in a process to come up with our final reading and what we decide we're going to do. And the process is everything. Uh, I just want to, before I get done, is to apologize personally to the school board for what I feel was disrespectful um, process that, that occurred. Um, I know I'm only speaking for myself, but please know that I was a guest. Uh, and I watched the, con the uh, council meeting last night after I returned, and I'm, I'm still a little, like, bubsmacked is the word my Irish grandmother would use. So anyway, that being said, uh, thank you for this opportunity to, to uh, ask a couple questions and make a statement. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I did want to mention, I did receive one email um, from Councillor um, Katie Foley. And so I wanted to put it on the table that she is actually recommending. I mean, it, and it wasn't specific necessarily to the school board's budget, so I don't know wh yet where that's going to be placed, if it does get placed. But she is recommending that we increase um, the budget by $3,500 in order to facilitate a uh, workshop with the school board and the town council um, next year. So um, I'm not really sure which budget. Um, at the very least, is that something um, that should um, be considered um, and either funded in your budget or would it be preferred um, that we fund it in our budget? Uh, we haven't really had the opportunity to talk about that in okay. detail, so I wouldn't really feel comfortable speaking for the board. Um, I think it's a fine idea. Um, I would argue that, that uh, those funds could be better spent um, on potentially maybe getting someone to come in and advise us on, uh, an outside consultant maybe, and advise us on the budget process. Um, but ultimately, we haven't had that opportunity to discuss it as a board, and so... Uh, okay, that's fair. Maybe. Great. Um, and so with that, I didn't receive any, at least as of uh, this afternoon, so I'd like to turn it um, over to public comment. If there's anybody here from the public that would like to uh, come to the rostrum and uh, um, speak, you're welcome to. If you can just state your name and address. And could we ask if you use the wireless microphone? I think that one's a little more robust than the, the uh, one on the stand. <coughs> this one here? Uh, Liam Summers, Holmes Road. I, um, I just have a concern. Um, Yesterday morning, my wife and I were up at 7.30, both of their laptops open, ready to go to sign up for aftercare. Uh, I serve on the, on the committee for Parks and Rec for the town, and um, it is a significant issue right now with a shortage of space for before and aftercare for our kids, uh, working families, uh, with parents who are both working. Um, and uh, I know there's at least 50, maybe more families that are going to be out of luck uh, for aftercare uh, and have to scramble and figure out what to do with their children after school gets out uh, while they're trying to work and, and, and uh, you know. Uh, so I have a significant concern about that. Uh, like I said, my wife and I were both ready there at 8 a.m. when it opened up and we both hit the button and we were still, I don't know, 15th in line for spaces. We got one day out of, out of five. And so we'll be scrambling to figure out the other four days. And I'm sure that applies to many other families. Um, when I was in my last Parks and Rec meeting, and they, they service with the, um, the town who, who does all of the, you know, the, the aftercare programs, um, one, they, they've been looking at a lot of different opportunities for space. Space is the major problem, and then and personnel is the second problem. Uh, so they've been looking at a lot of opportunities. I know they were talking about the Rock Church at some point. Um, maybe space there, but it is a crisis, uh, and I think what we see coming up um, with the enrollment numbers for K through two, that crisis is going to continue to build, and it will snowball. 
Uh, and so we have a, a, a decrease in enrollment in the upper end of the school and a, a massive increase in enrollment coming up uh, on the lower ends. Um, and so I encourage the board, encourage the town to start thinking about next year and the year and the year after that because this will be a recurring problem and families in, in town will have a real challenge um, trying to keep two parents working and, and, and taking care of their kids at the same time. Uh, and for the school board, uh, if there is any opportunity to free up classroom space, one of the things we talked about in our, in our last meeting in the Parks and Rec was, is there any additional classroom space that could be utilized at Wentworth um, that's being held aside for labs or whatever? If you can encourage the teachers to free some of that up, um, that would be uh, of significant help as well. So it's just, it's gonna be a problem for, for folks uh, and it's, it's a real critical need. These are our youngest kids, you can't just send them home. Uh, and so, so I just encourage folks to start thinking, not just this year, but two, three years down the road. Thank you. Uh, uh, Liam, if you, I, I just wanna mention, um, just for clarity, one is that the um, aftercare, before and aftercare is actually managed through our community services Correct. department. Yep. So it will be something that would be addressed through that budget even though I think from our long-range planning perspective, I hope staff um, takes a look at what that fundamental need is going forward. So um, I just want to make sure people understand it's, that's, that's not in the school's budget. Yeah, I didn't mean to conflate yeah, the two. I that was just a concern. Yeah. Uh, and the only reason I bring it up is that I know that there's, um, they're looking to find space, and Wentworth came up as a yeah. potential. And so it would have to do with the teachers and, and, and negotiating that type of a, uh, you know, use of their room so but thank you for the clarification yeah. anybody else good evening hi uh john clutchy nine wildwood lane um i'd like to echo liam's concerns uh i drove by town hall the other day and there was literally a line around the corner of um, parents waiting to get in and th this was for the renewal um child care program so um, I did have a, a few things that I wanted to say. Uh, I came to speak in favor of the proposed school budget. Um, between 2016 and 2018, the local tax burden in Scarborough decreased 8.6%. Uh, and I want to repeat that statistic. Our local tax burden decreased by almost 9% between 2016 and 2018. And we all know that last year's budget increases didn't even keep, keep up with inflation. This could be compared to the average local tax burden increase across the state of Maine of 7.4% over the same time period. That's a 15 point uh, spread in favor of Scarborough. We've been conservative in our approach to absorbing the reduction in state funding and a shift of some expenses like teacher retirement funding to the local level. There's a cost associated with the conservative local tax posture we've taken over the past few years. And I believe that our staff is currently bearing the brunt of it. The increase in Scarborough's property values combined with moderate growth and economic development has helped us to afford a transition to local funding for most of our needs. Now it's time to step back and evaluate if, if we've dug ourselves into a hole along the way. I've done some benchmarking with publicly available school and municipal data and in 2018 we spent 3.2% less per household on education than our peers. Our peers being defined as other districts in Maine with a median income greater than $75,000. York, Freeport, and Berwick spent less than us. Gorham, Yarmouth, Cape Elizabeth, Cumberland, and Falmouth spent more. Only York really receives less funding from the state than Scarborough. So considering this data and the pending surge in enrollment across the K-2 schools, I believe the school budget as proposed to be reasonable. There are some individual pieces that I may challenge, um, or I might believe they're too high or too low, but in aggregate, I believe this is a reasonable and responsible budget and would encourage you to support it. Anybody else from the public that would like to speak? Going once. I do have something to say, but I don't know if it's Go ahead. appropriate now. Okay, thank you. Uh, the majority of Scarborough's town council has voted to amend the budget at its first reading, now leaving us at an unprecedented juncture. Because this is the decision of the council, I will focus my efforts as a school finance committee member on effectively responding to this situation while meeting the needs of our schools. With that being said, the council now has an important decision to make. How will the $1.3 million reduction be accounted for between the town and the schools? As you make that decision, there are some points that I request you consider. The schools are not revenue generators, and therefore, we have no opportunity to adjust projected revenue to offset this reduction. 
any approved reductions will come directly out of the school's budget. As we all know, there is significant student growth anticipated next year. The rough estimated cost to meet the fundamental required needs for this growth is $852,240. Growth alone reflects 28.6% of our requested increase in our budget, so nearly 30% of our um, requested increase is related directly to growth and nothing else. The school's capital budget is and has been significantly underfunded. We are un underfunding capital projects in our schools by approximately 50% of the state recommended average. Some of the capital requests this year include shockingly basic maintenance projects due to our history of underfunding, including fixing leaking windows, rusted doors, and failing toilets. Additionally, we have not even asked for the money to address the aging heating systems in our K-2 buildings in middle school, both of which are in desperate need of replacement. There are needs in this first round of our budget, including some that have been identified as unmet needs that just don't seem as though they should be negotiable. One ask, as you've heard um, already tonight, is a dedicated human resource employee Scarborough Schools, with approximately 600 employees, does not have uh, this position filled. Many comparable main schools have a dedicated HR professional, and it's hard to imagine a private organization of this size without a human resources manager. Another ask is a career pathways teacher. At least 20 of our neighboring schools provide this basic opportunity for students who are not pursuing a college education but will be entering our workforce or have an internship opportunity as they determine their future. Another ask, as you've heard, is unified sports. 60 main schools already have unified basketball at the high school level, but Scarborough doesn't. These are just some examples of the essential needs in our school. When you are discussing how you will allocate the $1.3 million reductions, I ask you to think about these examples and how truly necessary it is to fund our requests. I heard many of you say at first reading that you were not advocating for the reductions to come from the school budget. And upon further reflection, I hope you stay true to that commitment. Any other public comments? Question for uh, Tom and Julie. Um, relative to the HR position for the school, obviously that's a significant component for our school system with the number, number of employees that we have. So my question for Tom and Julie would be, uh, is there an opportunity for shared resources where we have three full-time with the town and, and none with the school? For my part, I think that's a, an area that's really, certainly ripe for cooperation. I, I can't sit here tonight and say that we could roll that out immediately. I think there would need to be some further thought. Um, in, you know, onboarding employees is certainly one thing, but professional development and all the sort of unique elements that um, I don't profess to understand on the educational side uh, really do require some dedicated uh, trained professionals. So the short answer is yes. I think there's great opportunity. That's something we can and should look at. I should also correct, when I say three, that includes full payroll processing. There's undoubtedly payroll folks on the town, on the school side that aren't, that haven't come up in this conversation, but uh, just for comparison purposes. Uh, and I can tell you, those three work very hard. Um, it's not as if we have um, existing capacity uh, beyond what they're already doing. So we could do it. We would uh, really want to be thoughtful about how to do it and to be cost effective. I would just add that certainly there's lots of opportunity to share services, but it would still require additional staff. Um, you're not going to absorb 500 plus employees with existing staff on the town side w without adding. Um, and I think that it, it is quite different and we have the benefit of having um, an HR director on the town side who has done that very job before in another community. Um, and so he can speak really smartly and um, precisely to the benefits, the pros and cons of, of that. Um, but the reality is for both of us, this is our most precious investment. And so we really need to look at 
you know, how do we how do we protect that return on investment? Any other comments or questions from the public before I close public hearing? Going once, twice, we'll close the public comment section. Thank you very much. Um, so what I would like to now do is um, move into maybe final comments from the committee members about um, the questions that, if we can go back to the slide regarding the questions that were asked of us by our colleagues. Um, and I want to kind of preface uh, once we are there. Um, so uh, before we get into the specific uh, responses, um, I hope that people understand that there are really two processes uh, to consider. First is that the Town Council's Finance Committee follows one process while the actual Town Council follows an overarching or, or one that kind of overlays that and is, um, takes it beyond our work um, through the referendum process. So we can talk about that as well. Um, as Chair of Finance, um, and you know, I'll, I hope that Pete and uh, Don can chime in, I really look at that where we are uh, regarding what occurred last week is that there are four outcomes that could happen. Um, the four outcomes are really, and I think in a very linear, uh, linear business perspective, and that is that 100% of the adjustment um, could come from the schools, 100% of the adjustment could come from the town, um, a percentage, um, and of course there are multiple um, uh, you know, conversations around um, who bears the burden um, in a split uh, decision, but um, you know, there's some type of percentage um, allocation between the town and the school. Um, and then there is um, uh, there is a possibility. Uh, I shouldn't say possibility. There is um, the pendulum swings uh, just as far <coughs> left as it does right, and that is that the actual recommendation out of this committee is that there actually is no change, and that we recommend that the town council reverse their amendment um, and fully fund um, the requests on both the town and the schools. However, I do need to be clear that, and I'm going to outline kind of the timeline, which will answer one of these questions, is that because of the governance model that we have, um, the second reading, we could have an additional amendment that either, even if we recommend, let's say the majority of this council says, I'm sorry, this committee says, we support the recommendation of the council and it goes back, that does not mean that there can't be an amendment at that second reading that reverses that um, or extends it beyond. Because I know in a couple of years, um, we've had a decision out of this council and there was a recommendation, I think two, Maybe last year it was $500,000. I think the year before that there was a $2 million adjust or request. I mean, there's been different. And so someone can technically come up with a, an amendment request that um, makes it even more complicated in the conversation. So um, just from a logical kind of pathway, I mean, those are the <coughs> outcomes. I don't know if you want to add anything, at least regarding outcome, you know, possible decisions that could happen. Um, well, I kind of follow through, but I think, I guess the analogy I use, I'm not sure this is, I mean, our normal process in the past would have been, we have the budget of the first read, and then our committees work it separately, then I think in the past, I mean, then we'll come together and we usually make a, I, I'm speaking for the town finance committee now, for our, our budget, we come back prior to second read with the finance committee's recommendations for changes. We then can introduce an amendment to change that number. I mean, so this is just sort of the reciprocal yeah. the way I kind of look at it. And so as a process forward, you know, I thought maybe when you look at the schedule, we are scheduled to be together on May 8th as a joint finance committee meeting. Yes. Yeah. So, so my next, so this ties in well to the next piece. Okay. And, and that is the top, the, really the timeline of activity and then what okay. can occur at that timeline. So it's perfect segue. So um, I still would like to have a conversation about whether we want to make a decision tonight um, and give some direction because it is one of the questions. But the timeline, so people are aware, is that on April 24th, the finance committee, this finance committee meeting, uh, will um, uh, meet and um, hear from the town manager regarding his departmental budgets. Um, at that meeting, it was originally intended that we would only look at the most, and I don't want to. Um, diminish any other departments, but we were really looking at the most significant budgets that had the most significant change. There are several that are minor in comparison to the overall. We may want to look at that, um, especially if one of the expectations, at least from one counselor who said it, is that 100% of it comes from the town. I think 
on our end, we need to look at the entire picture, and we may need to have another meeting. Um, and then on May 6th, um, we have an open meeting scheduled. Generally, that meeting, um, we initially talked about having that um, not only for the, for the budgets that we don't have scheduled, but it also would be the decision making of this board, uh, I'm sorry, of this committee on that date. So May 6th would be the, the date that we make our recommendation, or that we vote on our recommendation and forward it to the council. Uh, for final enactment or for their review and final enactment. Um, um, the joint part of this um, is that on May 8th, we do have a joint finance committee meeting with the school board, and it's of the entire bodies. So it's all seven councils and all seven school board members, um, which is it's nice because it's two days after the committee's recommendation where we will then present to the full um, council um, what, what that recommendation is, and then we can have a conversation about where the burden um, rests. And then on May 15th, one week later, there is a second reading. Again, I just want to mention is that um, even between May 8th and May 15th, there can be amendments that are unknown and offered up at the last minute that impact all the departments. Um, it could be specific, it could be all of them. So, uh, and then June 11th is the referendum question. So you have a little less than one month in between the second reading and then the referendum. Then there's obvious, and then I know that on top of that, the school board has their own kind of approve, um, their own review process after our decision, because then they go back and then they have to talk about um, where those priorities are based on changes. And then there's a whole, the what if, you know, what if it doesn't pass on first referendum and adds additional referendums and meeting requirements and conversations that I'm not gonna, um, I'm gonna be positive and think that this might hopefully pass on the first one. So I, th between the two, does that help answer, um, I think, two of these bullets? Um, being, you know, uh, what is the budget process going forward? Um, and when does the town council anticipate um, providing a bottom line to the school? So I didn't quite hear the when do you anticipate providing us a bottom line. Was that the May 6th? May, May 15th. May 15th. Okay. So. Well, I think we'll have a recommendation, correct, on May 8th when we come together as a full council and full board? We could, but we could. Um, okay. I, I just want to, based on what occurred, there can be amendments in between May 6th, or, sorry, May 8th, the joint meeting, and May 15th. Because any councilor has a right to be able to make an amendment. Mm -hmm. So then if you all have second reading on the 15th, the school board has second reading on the 16th, mm -hmm. that's really just a procedural piece, correct? Yes. But an important procedure, that is the yes. number that goes to the voters. Yes. Yes. And that's that's a date that I really think we need to hold firm on. Um, yes. Once we start backing up from that, we're then shortening the time frame, perhaps deballoting. So that's a date that yeah. I think we had to work backward from. And, and I think if anything that was uh, consistent and um, almost unanimous at the meeting was that we want to stick to the same plan and the same set schedule. Yes. Yeah. Can, I, can, I, can I ask a question? One year, though, Tom, or a couple of years now, I think, when we've kind of gotten into these places, hasn't there been sort of a, a process by which we kind of all get together and kind of say, what are the things that we can bring to the table that may be vectorous to that number? I mean, I think without a specific, I mean, the, the specific target is this is the amount, if we want to get closer to a certain number, here's the amount of money. I think there's been some process in the past that there's been a collaboration, and is that something we can do together? There, there's a possibility of scheduling more meetings if we need to, mm -hmm. to make that final mm -hmm. timetable. Um, yeah, as I recall, the process, uh, I think, it always involves a final piece, uh, gap to close, if you will, yeah. a final adjustment. Yeah. Uh, typically, we are informed through uh, the process by way of refinements. Uh, there's often some conversation and collaboration and, and decisions kind of made going forward on a going forward basis. So that, f that smaller piece that Julie and I are often asked to come back with recommendations right. regarding is right. a much smaller piece. Uh, at this point, we're just not sure where to put our stake in the ground. I think, um, and, and so you're 100% right, we did have that collaborative uh, meeting. Generally, that was what the joint session yeah. two days after is intended where refinements and if anything is more known uh, based on estimates as well as um, uh, as well as you know what are the other things such as can you answer the question about the consolidated services sure. question 
would be then hopefully known and researched in time for that. Um, and uh, you know, tell me if I'm speaking out of turn here for the two professionals or for, for the staff. Um, I think you're both prepared and know that um, there's that p pendulum swing and that you're prepared or you hopefully will be prepared at some point to be able to tell the community what would happen if $1.3 million came out of each of your budgets. It won't be a fun exercise, but no, it'll be prepared to terrifying. do the work. Can uh, we not do that? <laughs> I feel like that's like panic inducing. I don't want to talk out of turn, but I really would rather not go out into the community with a budget that has been cut by $1.3 million. I don't think that there's, that's a valuable exercise. But wasn't, wasn't there a process by which, you know, I mean, Tom has already mentioned that for the Finance Committee, there's a pretty significant part of this that's related to policies that we pass that has to do with how we finance mm -hmm. equipment reserves, moving a lot of stuff that's been capital into operational expense, mm -hmm. that goes a long way to closing the gap we're talking about if the finance Agreed. committee decided to change that policy. That then leaves a smaller gap, which is sort of similar to what we've defined in the past, that it doesn't have to be 100% school or 100%. I mean, those financing models doesn't mm -hmm. impact your budget. It doesn't impact programming. True. True. It's it's really it's, it's is it capital or is it not capital? Right, and that's why I led by saying you know I think there's some territory that needs to be covered that it's it's not going to produce much pain. Certainly not it's going to affect the classroom or service levels. And and I, I think you're right. In my estimation, there's more than half of the adjustment is is wrapped up in one or more of those combination of decisions. So Sean, is that that's a finance committee decision for us? So can we leave that into the fabric? That then arrives instead of instead of looking at a hundred percent either or, if 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 that finance is a place that we go, then that mm -hmm. leaves a much different piece. Mm -hmm. And is there a way we can collaborate <laughs> in some manner, even if it's an additional meeting, about gee, are there some things we can do to, to kind of close that gap? So um, what I would suggest, I think uh, absolutely, I think between the twenty fourth and May sixth. Um, is that we should move the joint meeting of our two councils, our two boards, um, to have that conversation somewhere in between the, those two dates. It's a very short window, it's only a week, so we all have to be flexible with our schedule, but absolutely, I think that we can do that. Yeah. Um, so, as I mentioned at the beginning, after the 25th, we should be prepared to come with it, um, any sort of adjustments right. from the proposal. If you're proposing switching the meetings on the 6th and the 8th, are you, is that what you're um, suggesting? So adding one in. Adding in between. I, oh. Could we do that? Well, mm. today's the 8th? The 8th is a Wednesday, Wednesday, and the 6th is a Monday. And so just a, a critical day for us is Tuesday mornings is when our leadership team meets. Yeah. Um, and so they have obviously are a critical part of this process. So if we could meet on the 6th, and then that gives me one extra day with them before second reading to process sure. whatever. So is the 8th the first meeting? I don't have my calendar or phone open. Is that the first meeting of the month, May? No. No, May 1st. It's the middle week. May 1st is. So um, I don't have, I'm not adverse to switching the two. What do you guys think? I, I mean, conceptually, but where are we now? Just I, So I on May, instead right. of yeah, having our open and, and decision making on May 6th, yeah. we actually have the joint session together on that date. And two days later, the finance committee meeting will take that information that's presented at the budget at the joint session, and we will um, contemplate and have a discussion about our final recommendation. So we just reverse those two dates. Yeah. Seems like process-wise, that would make more Actually, sense. Actually, but you're removing the pub. We just need to consider where we put the public hearing. Oh, I, I, and I apologize. I actually forgot that because May 1st is the public okay. hearing. Correct. And Correct. Monday is not, I don't think, a regularly scheduled town council meeting. Monday, May 6th. No, it's, it's a budget review meeting. Yeah. The good news is we've already booked the chambers out, so that's yeah. one of my biggest yeah. concerns is that you switch meetings and the space is not available. Yeah, this one's easy. And the, if you're flip-flopping, I think we're fine. So, so yes, yeah, so inherent, in the, and it's always been a problem, is that the public, because of the timeline, I forgot to mention, so thanks, um, the public hearing um, is actually scheduled, for, at the town council level, is scheduled for May 1st, mm -hmm. which is before the joint session conversation mm -hmm. we have, as well as the final recommendation from the... From the council, or from the committee, which I don't know, part of me says is actually kind of good because then I can hear more input yeah. um, yeah. before any final recommendation and even yeah. before the joint session that we have together. Yeah. So 
I'm not necessarily I'm, adverse think, in keeping what that. What I heard from the community, though, and, and I don't want to misrepresent what anybody says, is they need to know what they're speaking on. And I so, so maybe we should just consider that as potentially having it after right. um, the joint, so when we have our revised budget. Yeah. So that's where um, I then have to uh, defer to uh, the gentleman uh, who is chair because the public hearing is, is a control of the chairman of the council, not the finance. So if they wanted to consider either moving that public hearing or adding a second one before the final reading, then that's something that you would have to take into consideration. As long as Tom can work magic and get space. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, the one thing you could do, and I know it's a, a practice that the council really wants to stay true to, is you could combine public hearing and second reading on the same night. That, I mean, that's a technically possible, whether it's practically the right thing to do. Or hold hold the one on the first for, and given the fact that not everything's known, but you may learn some, get some good input, mm -hmm. and then have an additional one as kind of a backup um, bootstraps and suspenders on the fifteenth. And so you're really going overboard to yeah. Yeah. solicit input whenever you can, before and after, if you will. Yeah. Do you think there's space that I mean, we'd have to check, right? Yeah, we're scheduled. It's a regular meeting, council right. meeting, so it'll be done as part of that. Um, isn't it inherent in the process that we already technically have a public hearing as part of the second reading? Because any citizen can get up um, when the order is read to have a, make a public statement. True. Yeah. Right. So it's already inherent in the process. It might just be I, a good point to communicate yes. clearly yeah. that you, you know the intent and purpose of <laughs> both True. of those meeting dates. Yeah, our practice allows for that, but yeah. uh, we can go so far as to publish a, a second public hearing with legal notice and the Correct. like. But we can also get that word out. Through other means. Maybe if we start an hour earlier to allow it as well, of the regular meeting. Um, so the only piece that didn't get covered as far as that um, kind of uh, timeline is the question that you had regarding um, uh, the neighborhood budget uh, forums that are happening, because where this information is so fluid right now. Um, so I don't even know where to begin thinking about that, because we have three remaining, as it's shown up on the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, Tuesday, April 23rd, which would be before the finance, uh, before the town actually presents their budget, and then May 2nd, which is the day after the public hearing here at Town Hall, and then May 4th, which is the di two days before the joint session. Um, the issue is really the content of the presentations. It's not mm -hmm. really the schedule, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to say so far, I've attended both uh, the neighborhood outreach meetings so far, you can very lightly attend it. I don't mm -hmm. know if that if people are just slow on the take up reel getting into the process, but um, uh, and and the presentation has been pretty high level. We haven't gone into a lot of detail. Uh, and I think actually the last one, the, the slides have been changed, right? To reflect what was done in first yeah. reading. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah, and that yeah. didn't. Right. So I, I think. I mean, how do people feel about? continuing that process and just say it's a moving target it could be a job I mean does that does that make sense to all of you to I honestly don't think that the one on Tuesday makes sense because we will not even have met as a finance committee okay. and again it'll be well we have lots of unknowns and okay. I, I think that just in terms of people's time it's better spent probably doing the work and letting the community know that we are going to still hold the other two I think that would just be my suggestion. Actually, I, I agree. I, um, and I would extend that further to Thursday, May 2nd, only because we have the public hearing on May 1st. Um, so, and then that's actually um, immediately before the joints. Um, and then, so then if we have the Wentworth School, it's also another, basically another public hearing because um, it's two days before the joint session in which we're going to take up the conversation and be more specific about what is going to happen. I actually respectfully disagree. Um, I think we should hold <laughs> the locations and schedule um, as published. Yeah. I think that, I mean, I obviously want to be respectful to people's time. Um, I have tried to attend as many. I've, I've also been at the previous two, and I know at least one of those other ones is mine also. Um, I don't, I know that a lot of the numbers are 
unknown and we have a lot of things in motion, but I still think it's important to be where we said we were going to be when we said we were going to be there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I don't, I personally don't really see it as that much of a time commitment to just honor those commitments. Either way. Sounds good. Yeah, I, I'm just I, one person. <laughs> I agree. I think it's well said. It's, yeah. it's, those aren't for us. Those are for the community. Yeah. So. so I would expect as we go, we would have more to talk about. The, there would be more granularity with the presentation, and we've also got a public hearing in there that I would expect would have a pretty robust you know, presentation that wouldn't just be uh, listening to what uh, the public has to say. I would think there would be some setup to that. Am I right in thinking about that or not? Well, well frankly, hearing. by the by the first, I don't think we'll have further clarity. I'm not sure what presentation we'll be able to provide. Okay. Okay. If I'm understanding your question. Yeah. There's typically not a presentation at the public hearing, is there? We've done it both ways, but uh, at most it's at very high level. Just kind of a quick introduction. I, I haven't had a chance to check the budget portal, but do we have, is there any feeling on the rolling q and A? I mean, what, are we getting good questions and, That's, you know, I have done that. that. Uh, there is no rolling Q&A on the budget portal. On the budget portal is the... Can you, can you, oh, you, can you, Sorry. Can you use this phone mic? Yep. <laughs> please. please. Sorry. Is it on? Is it on? Yes. So there's no rolling Q&A on the budget portal. There are the three different levels of the budget for people's reading pleasure. There is a section of um, for the handouts that accompany the meetings that will be improving next week when we've got a little bit more IT support to make that happen. Um, and in the supplements and archives, you'll find archived budget materials and um, other supplemental materials to the budget. But the neighborhood budget meeting questions that we gather during those meetings, I have started to put those into a Google Doc. S senior staff are starting to answer those questions. And once we have answers to the questions that are asked at the neighborhood budget meetings, they will be posted up onto the budget portal. Great. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Can I just ask you, sure. just for, we just talked about a lot of dates and times. <laughs> Could you just do a, a summary, just to make sure it's clear, everyone, sure. what the next steps are? <laughs> so, so on, on April 24th, um, the finance com this finance committee meeting will meet with the town manager to talk about um, major budgets uh, within the municipal services piece. Um, on May 1st, there will be a public hearing at the town council. On May 6th, there will be a joint session or joint meeting between the town council and the school board. So everyone um, on the boards are invited. And that is our time to then discuss um, what are our options and, and how we're moving forward. And then on May 15th, I'm sorry, um, on May 8th, there will be a uh, finance committee meeting of the town council to take those recommendations from the joint session and uh, make final decisions and a final recommendation that will be forwarded to the town council. And then May 15th will be the second reading. And that's at the town council. And May 16th is the school board second reading. Right, and so I did not not include the dates that the, town, uh, that the school board. That's fine. Yeah. So I think um, one thing I just want to add to that is I think you made the point, uh, Sean, that any counselor at any point in the process can make an amendment. Um, but I think to Tom's point, it, our, the date that we should be working back from is not June 11th. It's really May 15th. May 13th, because that's when early voting starts. Yes. Well, early voting starts on the 13th. Oh, Second sorry. reading is yep. the 16th. But I think we should all endeavor to make sure that we're in alignment, that there is no, as much as possible, um, sort of any surprise amendment on the 16th, because yep. that mm -hmm. would certainly not be in the best interest of any of us, any of our budgets, um, as well as unfair to the community. So if we can sort of <coughs> make that public agreement, um, that would be helpful. Any other questions from the, regarding the, any questions regarding your questions or did we answer them all? Alicia? Well, I, I mean, I, I guess I'm just trying to process that. Yeah. I mean, what, what you're asking is for the finance committee to commit for the whole town council that they're not going to make any amendments. And so based on what's happened, I'm a little bit concerned about that. I mean, otherwise then, you know, we are after absentee voting and yep. right the day before um, uh, the school board's second reading. And so I, I don't know what else 
to suggest, but it's it's just it, it's just so concerning to me that that we're up against yeah. those dates like and, that. And really, it's not a commitment of just the finance committee; it's the commitment of the entire council. So that because there is a majority that's not here. Right. So why why do we do the second reading after early voting starts? Um, and that's because the schedule, and please clarify, Mr. Manager, is that the timeline is prescribed by state law. We could start it two weeks earlier and uh, solve that, but we are within days of f fully fulfilling the absentee period. So we, we in large part, are providing what we view as ample time for absentee voting to occur. If it's shortened into weeks, I think it's arguable that it's not enough time, but we're within days of having the maximum allowable. And, I, and just from a historical perspective, being here the longest, is that we've always um, kind of uh, <coughs> adhered to that timeline that's prescribed. Because even though we would love to be uh, earlier in the process, mm -hmm. there are so, so many hard. unknown, <coughs> um, you know, unknown pieces um, around estimates for health care, insurance, I mean, whatever it might be. Right. Mm -hmm. But isn't it correct, or correct me if I'm wrong, you can take out your ballots on the 13th, but you can't return them till after the until after the second Until the number's gone. Okay. Yeah, correct. That's a good point. That's a good point. Yep. Yeah, good point. So with that, um, and, and no other questions, um, really the final, before final comments, um, you know, does the, does the committee want to take up the issue of any um, um, adjustments um, that there is an expectation, maybe make them known today for the school department to consider? Do you want to just defer that to the joint session? Um, it sounds like that maybe the best approach is to defer to the joint session. I'm comfortable with that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, last, just any final comments? Just if I could, before you get yeah. to that, yes, uh, yes, is there yes. any energy to <laughs> Councillor Hayes's question or a point that there's a conversation that's within the authority, if you will, of the Finance Committee, particularly around how we fund capital and those sorts of things? Is there any interest, either tonight or sooner than later, a conversation around that piece of the conversation that will help frame yeah. the next level of conversations? So, um, I personally, I would rather wait to hear your presentation at the next meeting, and then include that conversation at the um, at the okay. end of it. If you, if you guys don't mind, that, or if you need it sooner, or is, you know, I know schedules get tough, so I don't know. I, as long as we're committed to, if we have to stay late, we need to have that conversation no later than the next meeting. Well, we could schedule it as part of a di yeah. as discussion point on your meeting on the twenty fourth. Yes, yeah. we're already teed up for it. Okay, thank you. Just starting. Um, I, I want to make a comment. So as um, everyone knows, I'm uh, uh, heading out the door, um, which is a, uh, in a way a sad time for me because um, this is not only um, a wonderful experience and addictive, um, but I want to sing a song, swan song. And it's not about me, but actually I want to say it um, about Dr. Kuchenberger and um, the relationship that she has built. Um, I've been chair of finance committee during her three years, I believe twice. And I think it speaks volumes to the um, work and the ethics that you've given um, our community in your budget presentations. The fact is, is that two out of three budgets did pass on the first vote with your leadership and the school board and your staff. Um, so I want to say thank you uh, very much. Um, you've been extremely charismatic and thoughtful and a very good leader um, when it comes to uh, fiduciary responsibility and the needs of our community. So um, I just want to say thank you and I hope that um, I'm sure your board is going to um, provide you with many accolades before you leave, but I, I want to say this on behalf of the as Chair of Finance that it has been wonderful working with you because you've been extremely clear in what the needs are um, and how we can get to that point. I came in when the budget was 12% being presented by a superintendent, <laughs> so this is a very different environment and I've appreciated what you've contributed to that process. Well, thank you. That was certainly unexpected, but thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments? No. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Seconded. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you, guys. Great.